بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا العبد المؤيد ورسول المسلس السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I would like to congratulate you all for the birth of our beloved Imam Hussein عليه السلام Imam Zain al-Abidin and Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas Imam Hussein was born on the 3rd of Sha'ban Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas on the 4th and Imam Zain al-Abidin on the 5th and what we can say that those three great individuals, the father of Imam Hussein, the son, Imam Zain al Abidin, and the uh, brother, Abu al Fadl al Abbas, what those three individuals have in common is that they were all part of the Karbala battle. Uh, Imam Hussein alayhi salam leading the the army of truth, supported by Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam, and Imam Zain al-Abidin joining, but not in combat uh, role, because he was sick, he wasn't able to participate in the battle. But Imam Zain al-Abidin did attend, and he was around 22 years old when <coughs> He participated in the Battle of Karbala and he witnessed the battle. Actually, Imam Zain al Abidin السلام, is one of the eyewitnesses to the tragedy of Karbala. <coughs> so, those three individuals were the architects of Karbala revolution, each on his way and fulfilling his role. For Imam Hussein alayhi salam, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, history says Imam Hussein was born in the third of Sha'ban in the third year of Hijrah, after his brother, one year after his brother Imam Hassan. Now, some narrations say that Imam Hussein is only ten months older than his brother Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein was born in Medina. Before he was born, a lady named Umm al-Fadl, who happened to be the Prophet's uncle's wife. The Prophet had an uncle. His name is Al-Abbas. His wife, Umm al-Fadl, saw a dream. And in the dream, Umm al-Fadl tells the Prophet that she saw a part of the Prophet's body was thrown into her house. And she was, that was a terrifying dream for her, to see a part of the Prophet's body thrown into her house. So she came to the Prophet so worried and concerned about the dream. She told the Prophet, and the Prophet smiled, and he told her, La alayk, don't worry, the dream you saw is a good dream. Tell you, Ibnati Fatima, anti. My daughter Fatima will give a birth to a baby, and you will be nursing that baby. At that time, my dear brothers and sisters, there were no, you know, uh, formula milk. Uh, milk was not even available as it is today. Families was, would use a nursing lady to take care of their newly born infant. And this is what happened to the Prophet himself when he was born. His mother was not able to nurse him and feed him. And therefore she was, he was given to Halima Sa'dir. So, and that what happened exactly when Imam Hussein was born, Fatima al-Zahra didn't have enough milk to feed Imam Hussein. So she was sharing the baby, I mean sharing the feeding of the baby, with the <coughs> Prophet's uncle's wife, Umm al -Fadr. So Imam Hussein was born in the 
house of Fatima to Zahra. History tells us that the Prophet was very attached to his grandson, Imam Hussein. If you read the history of the Prophet, you can easily tell that the Prophet was a very passionate father. Very passionate father. The loving father. An emotional father. What I mean by emotional, a man who is moved by emotion. Who cries, of, of, who cries often when something bad happens. Who laughs when his grand kids are at his side. He would cry out of joy. So the Prophet was very attached to Imam Hussain That history tells us that every single day, despite his numerous commitment, the Prophet would find the time to come to the house of Fatima to visit Hassan and Hussein exclusively to see those two kids, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein. Often he would interrupt his own khutbah. The Prophet used to sit on the podium, the member, the pulpit, and give sermon. And he sees Hassan or Hussein entering the masjid while too small, unable to walk. They walk and they fall. The Prophet interrupt his own khutbah to come down to carry Imam Hussein in his lap, going back to the pulpit member, making Hussein sit in his lap, and then he continues his own khutbah. Or often the Prophet is engaged in his prayer. He is doing his congregational prayer, Maghrib or Asha, Dhuhr or Asr. And in the sujood, let's say it takes him a minute or so to finish his, less than a minute, 30 seconds to finish his sujood, they find the Prophet prolonging his sujood for a minute, two minutes, three minutes. And Muslims are unable to see what's going on because they are all in the state of sujood. So after Salah is over, some Muslims come to the Prophet and they inquire about the prolonged sujood. Ya Rasulullah, why it took you so long to finish your sujood today? Hal nazala alayk al rahi Was it Jibra'il that came down? Because often Jibra'il would come down during Salah. As the Prophet is performing the Salah, Jibra'il descends on the Prophet and he reveals verses of the Quran to the Prophet while the Prophet is praying. The Prophet says, no, it wasn't Jibra'il that came down. So, Ya Rasulullah, then why did you prolong your sujood today? He says, Inna waladi Hussein, my son Hussein was riding my back while I was doing sujood. He was riding my back. And I did not want to interrupt his joy, his pleasure. I wanted him to enjoy his ride on my back till he finishes. So I raise my head from sujood. The Prophet prolongs his own sujood in salah so Imam Hussein can play on his back, ride his back till he finishes. Then the Prophet would raise his head. What does this tell you? It tells you two things, my dear brothers and sisters. It's how passionate the Prophet is. Especially in the Arabian Peninsula, people used to be very rude toward kids and very tough. They would not show mercy toward kids. The Prophet, by showing so much love and mercy to Imam Hussein, he is disciplining his merciful nature. Remember, the Prophet is nothing but a rahma, mercy. So even in his sujood, he would prolong his sujood so his grandchild can enjoy his ride. Also, it shows how great Imam Hussein is. Otherwise, if the Prophet would not do this for any child, the Prophet would not do this for any child. Imagine another child will come 
and ride the back of the Prophet. I don't think the Prophet would prolong his sujood for him. It is for who he is. Imam Hussain is a great man. And the Prophet knows he is, this infant is a great, will be a great man, will be a great personality. So basically the Prophet was preparing Imam Hussain for, the, for his role that he will assume. And one more thing about Imam Hussein, my dear brothers and sisters, if you read the history books written by Muslims, it tells you that the Prophet وسلم, sporadically here and there would talk about the fate of Hussein to Muslims. He would vividly see he would vividly see his martyrdom coming. He was spotted more than one time crying. And when they ask him, Ya Rasulullah, why are you crying? He answers by saying that Jibrail told me that my grandson Hussein will be slaughtered, will be murdered. So the Prophet spoke about the martyrdom of Imam Hussein way before the day of Ashura. It was a well-known fact among the companions and Ahlul Bayt that this young child will be martyred. He will be the martyr of this Ummah. Everybody basically knew. It was a known fact that Imam Hussein will be the big sacrifice. For Abu Fadl Abbas alayhi salam, when Fatima al-Zahra died, a few years later, a few years later, Imam Hussein, Imam Ali alayhi salam, was seeking marrying another woman, another wife. So, having four children, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Zainab al Kulthum, Imam, Imam Ali, yet sought to marry another lady. Imam Ali alayhi salam sought the help of his brother Aqil. What was Aqil's specialty? Aqil's specialty was that he was an expert in the lineage of the Arab tribes. So he would tell you this guy from this tribe, this guy from that tribe. He knows the history of all Arab tribes. So the Imam alayhi salam, Imam Ali approaches his brother Aqil and he says, I want you to find me a, an honorable lady. A lady, a woman who is greatly courageous and brave. And Aqil says, why do you need such a wife with this quality? to be so courageous and so brave. The Imam answered, Imam Ali answered, So she would give birth to a child, I would keep that child for the day of my son Hussein. Meaning, I want my new wife to give a birth to a hero who will support his own brother Hussein in the day of Ashura. You see now the Prophet and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib are working in a unison. They both see the day of Imam Hussein coming and actually Imam Ali alayhi salam is even working toward that day by planning, planning to have a hero, a son like Abbas, to be supporting his son, Hussein. And that's what happened. So, Al Abbas was born. He married a lady whose, whose name is Umm al -Baneen. Now, her original name was not Umm al -Baneen. Her origi original name was Fatima bint Hazan. The day of the wedding, the Imam, Imam Ali asked his wife if she has any specific wish. She says, yes, I want you to change my name. Don't call me Fatima. 
And when the Imam inquired on why she would not want him to call her Fatima, she says, Ya Amir al muminin because when you call me Fatima, your other four children, Hassan and Hussein, Zainab and Kulthum, they will remember their own mother, Fatima. I don't want to cause that agony for them. When you call me, they will remember their own mother. Change my name. So Imam Ali changed her name to Umm al-Bareen, and she had her first son, Abbas. And Abbas, what can I tell you about Abbas? I can tell you one thing, that basically people, all people, most people, that's a typical nature, that people love their children more than their brothers. This is something that God has put in us, that we love our children more than our brothers. But with Abbas, it was the exception. As much as Imam Hussein loved his own children, but I think he loved Abbas more than he loved his own children. And it is very clear why he loved Abbas, because Abbas to him was like his own son. Abbas was 34 years old when he was martyred. Imam Hussein was 57. So that means Imam Hussein is 23, 24 years older than Imam uh, 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 Abbas, making him like his own father. And he was actually, to some extent, like his own father. Imam Hussein raised the Abbas, raised him. Even though he was his own half a brother, but he was like a father figure to Al Abbas. That when the Battle of Karbala took place, Imam Hussein did not stop his son, his own son Ali, from fighting. But when it came to Abbas, he says, "I have a problem allowing you to fight. I can't." I cannot be generous with you by giving you away. I can't. To me, you're different. You mean a lot to me. My heart would not allow me to allow you to go to the battle. I can't. He insisted on his brother Imam Hussein. He insisted that, please let me go and fight. Please. And the Imam alayhi salam, upon some hesitation, he says, إِذَا كَانَ وَلَا بُدْ فَطْلُبْ لِهَا الْأَطْفَالِ قَلِيلًا مِنَ الْمَعْ If you insist on fighting, I would not permit you to fight, but I would just ask you to get some water for those kids. And the mission he was sent for was not to fight. Remember, he was sent just to bring some water to the kids, to the 30 kids of Imam Hussein. But look what Abbas did. He did something that took him maybe one minute to do, but that made him an eternal figure that we, he shall be remembered remember to the day of judgment for that very brief moment of his glory. When he entered the river, Abbas was so thirsty. And Imam Sadiq alayhi salam describes how thirsty Al Abbas was. He says, the heart of my uncle Abbas was boiling out of thirst when he entered the river. And you know when someone is so thirsty, he would spontaneously stretch his hand toward water. And that's what Abbas did when he entered the river and he went deep, the level of water came up, he was able just to put his down, his hand down, and he was able to fill his hand with water. That's what he exactly did. He was so thirsty that when he entered the river to fill uh, the container some water, he put his hand in the river, 
filled it with water. He brought his hand toward his mouth to drink. He remembered the thirst of Hussein. He refused to drink. He threw the water away. He did not drink. And he says, I would drink water when my brother, when my leader, when my beloved leader and a brother Hussein is thirsty, I would dare to drink water? That's not going to happen. I will never drink water before my brother Hussein. Now imagine someone who has access to water and he is dying out of thirst, refusing, refusing to drink water for his love and loyalty to his brother Hussein. Isn't that a great? A few minutes later, he was killed, and his body was dismembered. But we continue to remember Al-Abbas for his great sacrifice. And Imam Zain al-Abidin was a 22-year-old when he attended Karbala, but he was sick, extremely sick, that he was not able to participate in the battle. And we Muslims believe that Allah made an Imam Zayn al-Abideen sick that day for a specific reason. And what reason? Imagine if Imam Zayn al-Abideen was killed in the day of Ashura, the line of Imama would have been cut. The lineage of the Prophet would be would been cut because Imam Hussein was killed along all his other children. The only son who survived was Zayn al-Abideen, who would continue the lineage of the Prophet. If Imam, if Imam Zayn al-Abideen was killed in the day, of judgment, uh, the day of Ashura, the entire lineage of the Prophet would have been uh, completely stopped and vanished. Allah, Allah specifically and intentionally made him sick that day. So sick that he was not able even to stand on his feet. And the day of Ashura when he heard his father calling, Are there any people willing to support us? He could not take it anymore. He got up from his bed, he took his sword, and he was leaning actually, leaning on his, leaning forward, carrying the sword, trying to protect his father. When Imam Hussein spotted him, he called on saying the Zainab, saying, Zainab, please take him in. Because he was afraid take him in before he is killed and then the lineage of the prophet would stop. <clears throat> and Imam Zayn al-Abideen was a man of great honor, humility, and tolerance. He teaches us how to be tolerant. A man comes to him and he uses every bad language in the dictionary. He swears at the, at the Imam. He insults the Imam. And the Imam السلام, would answer beautifully. He says, if, if all those things you said about me are true, may Allah forgive me. And if all those things you said about me are not true, may Allah forgive you. What a beautiful answer. What a beautiful answer. You called me names. If what you say about me is true, may Allah forgive me. But if what you say about me is not true, which is obviously, obviously not true, may Allah forgive you. How nice, how loving, how humble the Imam is by his answer. He's not to provoke. Even when he was brought to Syria as war prisoner. He's a war prisoner. His father was killed. His entire family was massacred. 
is brought to Syria as a war prisoner. An old man sees him and he comes near him and he says, I'm so happy. The man says to Imam Zayn al Abidin, a Syrian man, says, I'm so happy to see your family has been wiped out. And I'm so glad that your father and his supporters have been massacred in the, in the land of Kerbala. Because that's what your father deserves. But the Imam is not provoked at all. The Imam teaches us how do we deal with our enemies? With wisdom, with a nice preaching, with a smile, with akhlaq, with morality. Not to be provoked and going and rampant, yelling and screaming and attacking back. No. In fact, the Imam السلام, follows the instructions of the Quran. When someone insults you, ادفع بالتي هي أحسن. فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه ولي حميم. When someone insults you, do not repel his evil with evil. Rather repel his evil with good. The Imam smiles in the face of this old man. Syrian guy and he says I think I think you have mistaken by not recognizing who I am have you read the Quran the man says yes I have read the Quran have you read Allah Ta'ala the ayah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allah says to Muslims Allah says to the Prophet, tell Muslims that my only ajr, if you want to pay the Prophet, pay him off for what he has done for you, you pay him off by showing love to his family, that's it. This is the way we pay the Prophet, according to the Quran. Have you read this ayah? The man says yes. He says, I am the family of the Prophet. I am the family of the Prophet. Have you read the ayah in which Allah says, "Inna yuridu Allah liyudhiba ankum al-rizqa ahl al-bayt wa yutahharakum tatiira"? Have you read this verse in which Allah says, "Allah truly wishes to remove all impurity from you, ahl al-bayt"? He says, "Yes, I have." He says, "Nahnu ahl al-bayt. We are ahl al-bayt." He says, "Billahi ya alaik antum. Are you serious? You are ahl al-bayt. We have been told that you are a bunch of rebels." who rebelled against the legitimate caliph of Islam, Yazid. I didn't know that you are Ahlul Bayt. I did not know that you are related to the Prophet of Islam. He says, yes, we are. And the man flips completely, 180 degrees. And he declares <coughs> his condemnation of Yazid. He disavows Yazid. And Yazid sends troop to execute him immediately. Imam Zayn al Abidin lived at a time of materialistic indulgence. The empire, the Muslim empire, was expanding rapidly. Rapidly. There are new territories joining the big empire. And it is becoming bigger and bigger, expanding day by day. Islam started in Mecca and Medina. Now at the time of Imam Zayn al abidin the Muslim armies reached the borders of China in the east and all the way to Morocco and Spain actually. Spain. Tariq ibn Ziyad, the leader, the commander of Muslim armies. He crossed the strait from Morocco to Spain and he conquered the southern part of Spain known as Andalus. That's how vast the Muslim empire was. But unfortunately this conquest was not matched 
with a spiritual conquest. Meaning, the Muslim Empire was expanding rapidly in a materialistic term, but there was morally and spiritually, there was a decline in the Muslim Ummah. There was more and more of moral decay invading the body of the Muslim Ummah. And Muslims were going astray from the teachings of their own great prophet. So the, the Imam السلام, found himself responsible to cleanse, to cleanse the mind of people. Working on a new generation of Muslims. And that's why he authors a Sahih al sajjadi Please read the Sahih al sajjadi It's a treasure. It's a treasure. Sahih al sajjadi it's a compilation of supplications, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful supplications by Imam Zayn al -Abidi. One of the most precious treasures left for us by Ahlul Bayt <laughs> Read Sahif al sajjadi through dua, supplication. The Imam was working on bringing the Ummah back to the track by focusing on the inner soul rather than on the territorial expansions. And he succeeded in raising great students such as Abu Hamza. You all remember Abu Hamza, especially in the month of Ramadan. We read the dua that carries his name, dua Abu Hamza. Beautiful dua. So basically the Imam found himself charged with a spiritually reinvigorating the Ummah. And that's what he did. I think I'm reaching my limit. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all. I would like to congratulate you one more time for this beautiful and blessed occasion. The birth of Imam al Hussein, Al Imam Sayyid al Abideen, Abu al Fadl al Abbas. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all, to bless us all, to accept our deeds and our a'mal, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our knowledge on Islam, Ahlul Bayt alayhim as-salam and their path. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.